unlike some people here, I've been coming regularly to PSE for 10 years and probably 10 years prior to the existence of PSE. Um, for many years, all the problems of PSE were being blamed on the, the lack of a new building. Anything went wrong, it was, uh, oh, new building will fix that. Um, I'm, I'm monitoring things carefully to see how we're doing on that score. Um, today, um, and, and you know, it's just great to be here, and I, I'm a big fan of PSC, as you can tell. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, classes of inventions that many people are getting very enthusiastic about. And, uh, it's really resurfacing. It's the use of, of uh, this, this uh, graphic summarizes the whole talk in uh, one picture. So you know, this poor guy is, is not being captured by the safety net terribly well. Um, the class of interventions we're talking about are cash transfers, and there's a, a lot of people very enthusiastic about this right now. This is a quote from Annie Lowry in the New York Times just uh, recently, referring to the world's aggregate poverty graph. It is roughly what Americans spend on lottery tickets every year, and is about half of what the world spends on foreign aid. Uh, that calculation of the global poverty gap is for the World Bank's international poverty line, and it comes to um, $160 billion per year at, at purchasing power parity, or $80 billion per year at market prices. So if, for example, the, if, uh, the French aid, aid, aid agency was able to muster the money, it would be equivalent to about 10 new buildings, 10 buildings like this, the cost of 10 buildings like this per year would eliminate global poverty, according to this calculation. But of course, that could be complete and utter fiction unless we can come up with a way of actually doing the policy. And that's going to have to be informationally feasible, it's going to have to be incentive compatible, it's going to have to be fiscally sustainable, and, and so on. Um, and I'm going to argue today, none of those conditions hold, and the cost would be very substantially greater than this. And the big constraint, probably the most neglected constraint, is information itself. The information needed to actually implement such a policy. Okay, um, we have seen a response to, in this enthusiasm, and the two are going hand in hand, through the um, rapid expansion in, in social protection interventions across the developing world. And, and you know, 15 years ago, it was kind of rare to go to a developing country and, that had a, a social protection operation, in the sense of a, a set of, 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 of cash transfers targeted to, to poor people in some form. Um, we are by some definition of, of poverty. But, but that's really changed dramatically. We're now looking at a, roughly one billion people in the de in developing world receiving some form of assistance. And, and the growth is extraordinary. This is a calculation I did from the World Bank's Aspire data set. But the growth rate in, in the coverage of social protection type transfers in the developing world is 9% per year, about 3.5 percentage points per year. This is something big that's happening. Um, this is a picture I also made from the Aspire data set of, of coverage rates. I've, there are two things to note here. So on the vertical axis, we have the safety net coverage. And I've given you that for the poorest quintile. The poorest quintile is defined in each country and for the country as a whole. And I plotted that against GDP per capita. Um, two things to note here. The, the, the generally positive relationship, obviously, there's a spread. But the conditional means are, are increasing. Uh, um, in other words, poorer countries, lower GDP per capita, have uh, less coverage with these types of programs. But the second thing to notice is how much these are diverging. In other words, uh, richer countries are not just getting higher coverage, they're getting more of that coverage to the poorest people in their country. So the cruel irony here, as I put it, is, is, is poorer countries are having a harder time reaching their poor through this class of interventions. So roughly speaking, we've got two groups of people, uh, one billion people living in poverty and one billion people receiving social safety nets. There's just the limited intersection of the two. It's roughly two different billions. Um, so how much does imperfect information, which is surely the first constraint we're going to think about, how much does imperfect information constrain our ability to, to, to do these policies in practice in poor countries? Uh, how, how well can we rely on the type of data 
There's a huge information set we could imagine from some great household survey, but that's not the information set that governments are using. They're using a much narrower information set. So the question today is, how much does that narrowness actually constrain our ability to do what, for example, Annie Lowry was talking about, take, uh, to eliminate global poverty by perfect transfers targeted to the poor? The question. Yeah, when you say the lack of overlap between the target and the lack of what? Of overlap between the target uh -huh. you, you assume that you know yourself and the statistics which population you want to cover, right? So yeah. We, which, which is also part of the problem. You know, it plays an information problem. You have you face the information yeah, problem as well. Exactly. The is there any way we can? No. Okay. <laughs> um, these are the questions we're actually going to address. How well can we we do against poverty with such data? What methods of aggregating these data uh, into a score do best? So how do we take, how much does the information constrain what we can do? And how do we use that information? But that's what I mean by creating a score. We have a set of information and there's some score we attach to that set of information which we use to identify who's poor and how much they should get, how poor they are. Okay? Uh, and how much does impl do implementation lags constrain things? This is something that's, that's very obvious to me as I've been doing social protection operations for ages. And, uh, I mean, the implementation lags are, 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 are huge. It could take you five years between a survey and actually implementing the policy. Um, using panel data, I can simulate those lags. Two questions today. Um, how well can we identify poor households with the type of data routinely used? And secondly, I already emphasized the first question. Secondly, how well can we identify poor individuals using such data? We like to think that targeting poor households will reach poor individuals. I mean, poverty is ultimately an individual characteristic. How well does that work in practice? We can obviously make arguments, and we're going to, I'm going to outline them about intra-household inequality and other factors, you know, heterogeneity in the local environment, the local health environment, which could cloud the possibilities for identifying poor individuals using household data. Uh, both of these papers, this is a series of papers that um, I've written with uh, Kate Brown, a uh, PhD student of mine in, at, at uh, Georgetown, and Dominic van der Waal in the research department of the World Bank. So first question, uh, targeted with imperfect information. Um, the idea here in practice is what's called proxy means testing. We have this little set of information which we implement uh, more, more or less universally in some relevant population. It may be things about location, family size, housing conditions, and so on. And we create a score. And the problem is setting the weights on that score. Um, the basic uh, form of this is a, an OLS regression. Uh, this might be, say, log consumption per person in the household. This is the set of variables you're using. This is not aiming to be a the best possible model and all of, with all the imaginable data, it's rather the model we calibrate to that subset of the available information which we think we can implement more or less universally. Things, indicators like the nature of the roof, that's a favorite one, uh, whether the, um, the, the size of the dwelling, the number of people in the household, a subset of the information which we, we policymakers easily observe. Based on that information, we assign a score. And the, <coughs> the most common method, and, and when I say common, it's, it really is common, is, um, is to, use, a, is to create, use the uh, OLS parameters for this, to create the score. So the weights on the score become, become the, the score, the, the, the weight, the, sorry, the OLS regression parameters become the weights on the score. Um, we're going to look at various versions of this. I mean, one of the problems that might arise is, is different methods of estimating this model. I'm going to go through a range of methods that might be more appropriate. OLS has been the favorite in the industry, but, uh, and it is a bit of an industry. Uh, huge numbers of people doing this all over the place. Um, but uh, alternative methods, then alternative data. In a sense, is the problem the method we're using to create this score for deciding who's poor and who's not? Or is the problem the limited nature of the information? We'll try to separate those two things. The supporters are, are very strong on this, and, and it's a, it really is a, a large group of people who, who, are, who are doing it. It's, a, um, it's always a risk when you get a, 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 um, 
a method like this and you take it to governments and you, you, um, we, it, be, it becomes a, a whole lot of people start to earn their living out of doing this type of thing and that creates inertia and, and um, one is rocking the boat a little bit to even ask these questions but we have to ask these questions as researchers. The critics are, are, are quite a few and one of my favorite quotes here is um, uh, with reference to this method in, in application um, and this is from a field work uh, by the, these two. Uh, the targeting process as a whole is quite uh, poorly understood. One, one informant from a geographically targeted poor community noted, well, some people wonder why they weren't targeted even though they live in the same area. So we tell them that the Bible says that many are called, but few are chosen. <laughs> I love this. But there's also lots of to uh, work of uh, uh, Cameron Shah, lots of, of worry about social unrest, uh, that these methods treat similar people in unequal ways. And there's always a source of of conflict, and we're seeing that from field, real field reports. Uh, once or twice I've seen signs of that myself, but others have reported it. Uh, uh, what we can think of as an erosion of local social capital, distrust of local administrators. Um, uh, local people don't understand <laughs> this method. They just see people similar to them, and you know, one person's getting it, and one person, another person's not, and there's an unfairness to it, and that can actually um, undermine the credibility of social policy more broadly. People start to worry about the sustainability of social policy. And we can't address all of these questions, but we can certainly address the core question. How well does this method work? The first thing to, to do is a little bit of very basic econometrics that I find uh, people in the industry doing this in the social protection stuff of industry are somewhat surprised by the following absolutely mundane observation that the, there's always going to be a positive correlation between your residuals and your dependent variable in an ordinary regression. It comes with the turf. In fact, the covariance, and if, if you've got exogenous regressors, the covariance between the dependent variable and the residual is the variance of the error term. What does this mundane observation mean? We're going to overestimate living standards of the poorest people with this method. It's passing through the mean of the data. Right? So you're automatically going to overestimate living standards of poorest people and, under, and underestimate the other end. It comes with the, the method. The method itself is absolutely, is almost idiotic from the point of view of the objective function. And I'm actually going to show you an optimal, optimal method which fully internalizes the nature of the objective. The objective in anti-poverty operations is not minimizing the sum of squared errors in some regression. Maybe it's minimizing some weighted sum of squared errors, but I'm going to argue it's not even that. You have to formulate, formulate the optimal problem and, 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 and estimate your parameters from the optimization problem that you're actually addressing. Um, that uh, pretty much summarizes what we're going to do in the paper. Um, looking at basic PMT, which I just call our version, just looking at what people do, our summary of that. An extended version where we expand the information set in some obvious kinds of ways, but in ways that aren't typically done in practice. What is done in practice is pretty much what I'm calling basic PMT. You'll have to believe me on that. It's, um, then we're going to consider alternative estimation methods with more appropriate assumptions about the, the relationship between the estimation problem, policy problem. That includes characterizing optimally targeted transfers with imperfect information. Introducing lags and comparing econometric targeting to other methods. Assessing performance. Well, the literature here is sort of bifurcated into two approaches, one of which I'm very happy with, no surprise, and I contributed to it, and another approach which I'm, I'm less happy with. But essentially, one approach is about <coughs> choosing transfers across types of households to minimize some measure of poverty, and the other approach talks about targeting efficiency all the time using creating measures of targeting performance, exclusion errors, inclusion errors, the targeting differential. I'm going to explain these very briefly, but basically you focus on this concept of targeting, whereas the other method focuses arguably on the objective function that is relevant here, your impact on poverty. I'm going to argue that targeting is not the objective. Targeting meaning you know, reaching poor people per se, 
That's not the objective. It's actually poverty reduction, and the two may not be consistent. Um, what we don't do in this paper, we don't look at uh, alternative methods. We're thinking of social protection as targeted cash transfers. We don't look at self-targeting mechanisms. We don't look at community-based mechanisms. There are other papers doing that, but it's not today. Uh, we don't consider some of the, the costs of targeting. Um, we, we assume what the literature, is, the policy makers are assuming. We assume that we have a measure, a decent measure of household consumption from a survey, and that's our welfare metric, and we can test everything against that. Now, you may question that rightly. Uh, there may be definitely limitations of that measure, um, but we accept it for the purpose of this exercise. So, internally, you could say that these methods don't work well because you don't agree with the objective function of, of consumption as a measure of welfare, uh, and that's fine. You can take that position, but we're working within the presumption that that is the relevant measure, Given that, how well do we work? The measures of targeting, the inclusion error rate is just a proportion of identified poor who are not poor. Uh, the exclusion error rate, the proportion of poor who are identified as, as non-poor. Uh, this one, the normalized targeting differential, is the difference between the proportion of poor predicted as poor and the proportion of non-poor predicted as, as poor. Uh, if you thought of a transfer payment, the average transfer payment to the poor minus the average transfer payment to the non-poor. Uh, this one is, um, this measure of targeting, amongst all the measures of targeting, this is the one that's proven to be most correlated with the impacts on poverty of anti-poverty policies. But of course, you know, the fact that it's the most correlated with the same data, that's fine, but with the same data we can actually estimate the impact on poverty. One of the kind of ironies here is the obsession with targeting efficiency and targeting measures is not because you can't actually measure your objective function, your score on, your, on, on a relevant objective function. And that's a rather strange thing about this literature. Yes? Can you give the concern that you mentioned on the trend fairness? Targeting might be a goal in itself if you want to have people feel this is a threat. Uh, poss possibly, but, but, but maybe even then we'd want to focus on... on on the relevant concept of poverty and, and show them that, surely that would be more convincing. Um, okay, poverty measures, the standard trio, uh, the headcount index, poverty gap index, and the Watts index. Um, you know, I, I'm a great fan of the Watts index. If you don't know it, it's from a, a paper by Harold Watts, 1966. And Watts was the first uh, chief economist in the Johnson administration's war on poverty in the 1960s, and, and he actually sat down. This is 10 years before Amartya Sen's famous paper in Ari Stad on measuring poverty, and uh, Amartya didn't know about Watts Index, and none of us knew about it. I didn't know about it until the early 90s, and uh, it's actually a fabulous measure. There's a paper by Bong Zong uh, showing that uh, it satisfies every theoretical axiom for poverty measurement in the entire theoretical literature. <laughs> Uh, and it's the, uh, pretty much the only measure that could possibly satisfy all of these indices. And what is it? It's so simple. It's simply the, the, weighted, the, uh, the weighted proportion of poverty gap, the weighted, um, weighted by the relevant population weights, or the sample weights, and so on, uh, the, the log of the poverty line relative to the income or consumption metric. Um, I will also, although it's a great index, it's a natural candidate for the optimization problem that I'm going to outline because of its curvature properties. It makes everything very nice and clear in second order conditions. Okay, can we do better? Basic PMT, as I've said, is going to characterize what people seem to do in practice. Extended PMT, just get a feeling for how much adding extra information improves things. Um, tailoring the estimation method to the problem. Um, some obvious can alternative candidates would be a a quantile regression, where instead of passing the regression through the mean, we pass it through a relevant quantile. And obviously, the, the, the most relevant one here would be the, the, the uh, headcount index of poverty, the, the, uh, or the, the poverty line is the quantile of that. So we pass it through that point in the data rather than the mean. Um, that's an obvious candidate, and um, so we'll play around with that. Then poverty weighted least squares. This is something we thought we'd come up with, but it turns out something somebody else had. Um, the, where we weight the least, where we weight the um, errors, the squared error terms, by by how how poor you are. Okay, now these are that's essentially ad hoc. It's not a kind of a uh, 
an obvious thing to do. A uh, more obvious thing to do is set up the pr optimization problem properly. Instead of running a statistical estimator, let's try and back out the relevant parameters from a formulation of the public economics of the problem. And the public economics of the problem is to, in this particular case, is to minimize some relevant poverty index with a, an available budget and to find the parameters on the available information set which, satis which uh, satisfy this optimization, the optimization conditions. So what we're going to do, I'm going to think of the transfer payment as a function of, a, this is the, the vector of, of x's that the policymakers actually have. I attach a parameter to each one. So those, in, if you were in OLS regression, we get those parameters from running a log consumption against x, and they're just the regression parameters. But, but fine, we're not going to do that here. Um, we're just going to think of, uh, and I write it as this uh, linear thing with this nonlinear transformation to give a, um, a bit of flexibility. Um, so if, if this, uh, what, what is that a Greek symbol? If that thing is, is 1, then we're just talking about a, a linear policy. Yes? So you're taking the information set as free and fixed. Yes. Okay. Correct. Um, the, oops. The um, Watts index here and the budget constraint. Okay, so again, weighted the, some of the transfers as a budget I've got. So, so one way of thinking about this problem is just choose, just I'll finish this slide and I'll come back to you. Just choose these parameters to solve this problem. Yes? So, I know nothing about what's in this, in this is right, but as you were talking about it, I thought it was you're maximizing a utility function that's a log utility, except when you reach ZJ, you, you, you winsorize it at maximum. But then if you do that, this is not a formulation you would, if it's in, indeed my interpretation is right, your, your social welfare function is log utilities winsorized at a maximum mm -hmm. of uh, log of ZJ, then on your, you should index not on the sum, you see what I mean? Well, this is not what you're doing here. You, it's not what I'm doing here, but it's yeah, what, but you think, what you thought I was doing. Yeah, but it seems that what I thought you were doing would be ma more sense. Would make more sense, no? Because <laughs> <laughs> well, then you maximize the way you find the welfare function, no? Uh, Again, you can, I'm uh, totally amateur you could, those things. You I, could, I, don't you, know that I think you could right. formulate it that way, yeah. but in particular, to get it to this form would require a particular social welfare function, which was a, um, well, a version of a social welfare function where it was log, log consumption was the, the utility index, but we have weights on that, thing, on that so that we essentially drive the weights to zero above the poverty line. Yeah? And I think that would get you that. No, because... I mean, if, the weights are dri driven, if the weights are driven to zero, that's not what you, you, what you said. No, because... Okay, but let me, let me explain what I'm doing. Z, you can't be utility at log Z plus tau, yeah. as uh, opposed to log Z... Uh, uh, well, what, uh, what I'm doing makes perfect sense for my purpose. My purpose is to say, okay, this is my characterization of the policy problem. This is what policymakers are saying. They want to choose these transfers to minimize poverty given their budget. Now, you know, qualifications on that, how do we measure poverty and so on. So I'm just literally taking that. Minimize the poverty measure with an available budget and find the parameters on the, on the available information set which solve that problem. Okay, um, I'm not. I, I never even thought of, put, of formulating it in a more generalized uh, utilitarian or quasi-utilitarian social welfare function. That's put that aside. Okay, um, so that's clear. I think data and measurement assumptions. Um, we're going to use all of the um, recent LSMSs for. Um, I forget how we defined recent. So, um, 2009 was the cutoff. Um, for Sub-Saharan Africa, and I, we deliberately chose Sub-Saharan Africa because this is the, the region where we're seeing so much expansion and so much enthusiasm for these policies, and it's also the poorest region uh, now in the developing world, uh, now by, by far. Um, survey years from 2009-2014, um, typical sample sizes here. Uh, basic measurement assumptions, um, three poverty measures, uh, headcount index of 20%, headcount index of 40%, which is the average um, uh, poverty rate for sub-Saharan Africa, using the World Bank's international line. Uh, the national poverty rate, uh, 
for that country will be another possible value of H. Um, we're going to consider both fixed poverty lines and fixed poverty rates. When we looked at the applied literature, we saw examples of both. Fixed poverty line is, is just what it sounds like. When we, we do these calculations, we fix the poverty line, we fix it across both the original poverty measurement and across the policy. Um, often the, what that'll do is give you a, po a, a, a number of recipients, a proportion of the population receiving the, the policy, which is less than the original poverty rate. Why? Because of that thing I point out about the econometrics 101, the cor positive correlation between the residuals and the dependent variable. So it's also interesting, I think partly because people found that and sort of scratched their heads, well, why is that happening? I don't know. Well, another possibility is fix the poverty rate. If you started off with 20%, you pick the poorest 20% in your proxy means test score. Um, if you're using that method, then the, uh, the inclusion error rate and the exclusion error rate are automatically the same. We're going to call that the targeting error rate, and, and you can prove that very easily. Okay, uh, variables in X, um, a whole bunch of obvious things. Type of toilet, floor, wall, and roofing material, type of fuel, characteristics of the household head, some basic religion, demographic composition, and so on. And we played around with this set. I think are reasonably robust results, and you'll see some examples. Um, average R squared seem very typical of, of this literature. Uh, just a list of covariates, and I've summarized that, so I won't go through it. Um, summary stats, the, um, um, this is basically the R squared across those countries. Um, here we have um, and the, the sample sizes. This is the basic PMT, and this is the extended PMT. Obviously, we're doing a bit better on the extended PMT. Uh, here's this point about, uh, or here's, here's not the point, here's another thing. This is just the relation to actual predicted values for a, a few countries. Um, so here we see the inclusion errors are just, if this is the actual and predicted, these are the inclusion errors and, and these are the exclusion errors. Uh, and you see already, you, you've got some pretty substantial errors here. And here's some basic summary stats on the inclusion error, exclusion error rates for over the whole sample, about half of those identified as uh, as poor are not, in fact, poor, the uh, average inclusion error rate, and exclusion error, but 80% of the poor are not identified as poor. Essentially, what PMT is doing relative to, say, uniform transfer, what PMT is doing is reducing the inclusion errors, um, but exclusion errors are rising. Um, I think part of, you know, this is a parenthetical comment a bit, but um, and it's a bit speculative, but I, I actually think part of the rationale why this method has been so popular is exactly that. Reducing inclusion errors is very attractive to an organization like the World Bank, which I worked for for 25 years, um, and to many governments that are trying. Reducing inclusion errors reduces some of the cost of the policy. Reducing exclusion errors increases the cost of the policy. So it's very attractive to governments and, and agencies interested in macro stability and making sure that we don't spend too much on anti-poverty programs to focus so much on inclusion errors. Yet, if your objective is poverty reduction, you should, as I've argued a few times, you should move much more, put higher weight on exclusion errors. Um, this also gives results by country, but in the interest of time, I'll, 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 there's one table where I will talk a little bit more detail because I think it's more instructive. Um, and I just said this, basic PMT reduces inclusion errors at the cost of exclusion errors. And uh, here's the uh, relationship between the residuals and the, and the um, actual values, just making, again, the obvious point that, that they're going to be correlated, and with a standard exogenous regressors, the, co the covariance is just the variance of the error term, and, and you see that very, very clearly here. Um, so the method, the basic PMT method, is, is, is kind of built into the method that it's going to do poorly for poor people. It's exactly the people you're trying to, trying to reach with the help with the policy. Um, econometric targeting using OLS substantially overestimates consumption of the poorest, as I've emphasized. The differences are, are, are large. For the poorest, 20% in terms of actual consumption. The mean residual ranges from, this is a, in a log consumption regression, ranges, ranges from 0.73 to 0.37 minus, uh, implying that PMT regression yields predicted consumption of the poorest between 50% and 100% above their actual consumption. So this gives you an idea of just how bad this is. Um, Poverty-focused methods, now we can, we had hoped in this research that we'd come up with some great new method with a, the same information set which would do substantially better. 
We kept playing with alternative methods. We, you, know, you can go to town on this. You can use machine learning, you can uh, so on. But there's not a lot of point to that here because we can characterize the optimum. We don't need fancy econometrics here. We don't need any econometrics we can, because we can characterize the optimal parameters for the problem. You can't, by definition, you can't do better than that. So uh, you can tell me this uh, a lasso regression would be great. You can tell me whatever you like. You can play with it. But I can bound how much progress you can make with your uh, econometrics into this problem by, by, again, comparing it to my characterization, our characterization of the optimal set of the optimal policy. Um, quantile regressions, amongst the set of standard estimators, amongst the things you can readily, readily implement in Stata or whatever, um, quantile regression definitely does best within this rather limited set. But um, none of them do particularly well. Um, in fact, um, um, it's, it's really, the, the gains are, are very small. Um, extended PMT, again, that improves, the, improves things, but um, uh, not, not greatly. Uh, we were kind of a bit surprised how, how it sort of gets, the, all, of these, on all of these things, one way of thinking about it is the poverty objective function has got a very flat region across the parameter space, and a, uh, where the parameter space includes non possibilities of zero values attached to certain, certain variables. And it seems to be relative, very flat, over quite a large segment of this kind of n-dimensional space. Uh, so we're not seeing much improvement. Um, when you'll see this when I show you the results for poverty, this is target areas for extended PMT, but again, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that. And there are further results on robustness, pruning, different, using different methods of pruning to get to a, a, a um, sensible subset of variables from the extended model and compare that to the basic PMT, trying to introduce some more exotic things, community level variables, food security variables, and so on. And just believe me, we, we, that flatness remains. We don't see much of an improvement. The targeting differentials, um, I guess here if we focus on basic PMT, um, um, the targeting differentials. That means that that targeting differential for basic PMT means that we see about a 20 percentage, 21 percentage point higher um, poverty rate amongst the recipients than the non-recipients of a transfer of a PMT transfer is based on PMT. Um, and you can see that you know we we start to see some substantial gains. We go to poverty quantile regression. Uh, the targeting differential is, is more than doubled. Um, impacts on poverty. I, I wanted to focus a bit on this. Um, so again, the targeting differentials, targeting measures don't adequately capture the objective function of the problem, which is, is, is poverty reduction. Um, here what we did is take, okay, going back to that Annie Lowry quote, let's take the poverty gap as calculated from my, the best survey I've got. Let's take a budget which if perfectly targeted I hate to pick on Annie Lowry, but you know, she, she wrote the New York Times article. Um, uh, what Annie is proposing is take that budget and, 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 and give it to everybody exactly and fill the poverty gap. So let's take that budget and see how much impact on poverty I have with the information I actually do have. All right, with perfect information on this complete data set, we'll think of it as complete, I eliminate poverty. Now ask, with the information policymakers actually do have, the subset of that information, how much impact do they have? And we can do various simulations. We can do uniform transfer, a basic income scheme, categorical targeting, try different things to see. You know, PMT was invented to suppose, as, a, as an improvement, essentially, over categorical targeting, where you basically just identify particular groups of people and, and transfer uniformly within those groups. Uh, how much better does PMT do than categorical targeting? How much better, what's the difference with uniform tra transfers and so on? Impacts on poverty, most basically, this is this flatness that I talked about. Pretty much everything we look at, if I've got a budget sufficient to eliminate poverty, say my po I start with a poverty rate of 20%, whichever way I look at it, every way I look at it, I get that po poverty rate down to about 15 to 
with a budget sufficient to get it to zero with perfect information. So that gets you, gives you a, a good feeling of just how imperfect the information and methods are. Uh, in fact, and I'm going to show you, the optimal policy doesn't, it does better, obviously. It's the best. The optimal policy still only gets it down to about 15%. Um, lag for lags, uh, I'll show you, I'll demonstrate that in a moment. I'm skipping ahead a little bit. But a la lags in implementation, we can use with the panel structure of these data sets. And I can do a number of things. One is I can try to deal with measurement error by averaging over time in the panel. And, and you know, the paper talks about the results on that, and nothing much uh, happened, nothing much changes. Um, but uh, we can also introduce lags in implementation, various ways of doing that. One is imagine that you have to estimate the model at one date, and you have to use the same model over repeated years. That's, that is the reality. That's what's happening. Uh, in fact, the model revisions are, are relatively infrequent in practice. We can see how much that reduces the impact on poverty. Or we can imagine where you really have to implement exactly the same proxy means test for some number of years. You don't just fix the model, you fix the data. Roughly a 1% cost in terms, one percentage point cost in terms of the poverty rate associated with these lags. Okay, the optimal differentiated transfers. I think this table summarizes it. So it's worth stopping just to go through this, all these numbers. So here I've given you the Watts index, the actual Watts index across these countries and the overall mean of 0 0.067, um, about 7%. Uh, the poverty, the, the proxy means test gets you to um, 0 0.048. Now, uh, with the proxy means test, I should have mentioned this, but I didn't. One of the things you do in practice with PMT, and almost invariably, is, is you, you identify who's poor, and everybody who's deemed to be poor based on the PMT gets a, the same transfer. All right? Well, we can also ask, what about a PMT with differentiated transfers, where instead we fill the predicted poverty gap for each person? So I'm going to call that PMT gap method. Okay? And then here are the, op here's the optimal solutions where I solve that optimization problem, figure out what the, the parameter values should be. So clearly, uh, um, this, uh, this is the linear version with that funny little parameter set to 1 that I showed you before. And, uh, and this is the nonlinear version where I, I, uh, I used um, the squared value. So I've got a generalized quadratic function uh, of, for the policy. Now, you know, I don't know anybody's ever done that in practice, anything like it. Right? It's not actually that difficult um, now. I mean, you know, um, but uh, I, I don't know if anybody's actually done it. Um, but, but we find, um, I guess, the nonlinear is the best uh, one to look at. So obviously, these numbers have all got to exceed at least these numbers. But this, these numbers all exceed these numbers, and that's exactly what we expect. But it's really the, the, the difference here. So um, now, why? One thing you notice this. Basic PMT, you know, um, this, is what, this is what we expect. This was a surprise. You know, for example, that 0 0.048 versus 0 0.049. Um, that's just an indication of how bad PMT is amongst the very poorest. In fact, it's better. Rather than differentiate amongst the poor based on this proxy means test, give them all the same amount of money. That does better most of the time. That's a, just an indication of how bad the method is for the poorest. Yes? Oh, they do. They would be pretty small. Um, you know, but... Yeah. Um, well, I'm not showing them because I haven't calculated them, right? But, but yeah, I guess we could do that, but um, I'm not um, particularly interested in them, but uh, we can do that. Um, okay, so uh, summarizing that, um, 
allowing optimally differentiated transfers um, does does obviously does better, but still we're, we're not talking about uh, we're, again with budgets sufficient to eliminate poverty, we're get, not getting anywhere near that. Again, it's roughly equivalent to bringing a 20% poverty rate down to about 15%. Okay, this last question. Um, I have to be quick on this, but I was anticipating I wouldn't have a lot of time. And um, since um, Dominic van der Waal gave this paper here six weeks ago, I think some many of the people in the audience had more detailed exposure to it. Here we're, we're asking a next question, right? We've seen that um, household PM, PMT isn't doing that well by standard methods. To our frustration, we can't seem to improve it greatly um, a bit but it's not huge. The information constraint is, is, is clearly uh, very important. But what about this other information constraint? How well can we identify poor individuals with the, 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 the data at hand? I've got household data. I'm hoping to reach poor individuals. How well does that work? Um, I, don't th I think it goes without saying that poverty is, is really an individual phenomenon. Um, but we've also seen part of the motivation here is the, the, the research of a, of a number of areas in nutrition science, in economics, and, uh, and uh, elsewhere, and, um, even social psychology. We're seeing a lot of research pointing to a number of factors, intra-household inequality, epidemiologists pointing to importance of local health conditions, and a host of things that suggest that, that maybe um, uh, the, the constraints on, on ability to reach poor individuals are, are, are considerable. But how, how important are they? Um, now, clearly, we don't have individual consumption. Um, you just can't, I mean, there are very few surveys that have ever measured that. I, the uh, Senegal survey that uh, Sylvie Lambert and colleagues have, have been doing is one of the few, very few examples in the literature where we observe um, at some with some degree of aggregation, with some imprecision, obviously, we observe individual consumption, but by and large we don't. But there's one aspect of welfare which we do observe pretty well at the individual level, which is nutritional status. Undernutrition, stunting in kids, wasting in kids. Now, again, you know, we've got measurement error problems, but, but we, we, we have some window there. So we ask in this paper, how well uh, do I reach undernourished women and children and using demographic and health surveys, I'm not entirely confined to women and children, but, but that's my, the bulk of my coverage. De de demographic and health surveys have focused on health of, of women and children. Um, how old do I we reach undernourished women and children using household poverty data? That's our question. Again, a very simple question. And some descriptive numbers to try to throw some light on it. Um, one of the first starting points here is that the bulk of the literature on this topic is focused on what I call the wealth effect. You might call it the wealth elasticity. Um, and a host of papers, a very important early paper by um, Jerry Behrman and Neil Dalalaka, um, a, a series of, of, of research papers focusing on this parameter. It's actually not, it's you know, interesting, of course, but it's not the relevant parameter. The relevant parameter, we argue here, is the conditional probability, the probability of, of, of being undernourished given that one is in a poor household. We're going to calculate those conditional probabilities. Um, and they're going to be the, the, the subject of interest here. Um, data sources, we're going to use um, data on 350,000 women and children across 30 countries in sub-Saharan Africa from DHS surveys. We're going to complement that with LSMS surveys for certain purposes mainly LSMS surveys, which include, obviously, we're constrained by LMS, LSMS surveys that include anthropometrics, which is typically not the case, but we have a number of, of examples, I think seven or eight out of the, the 30, where we can do that. And the wealth index in the demographic, demographic and health survey is a, an aggregate, a bit like a PMT score. It's an aggregate of a bunch of, of, of assets held by the household. Um, and a few other variables. So think of it as a bit like a PMT score. And we're going to ask now, not how well do you reach poor individuals in terms of consumption or some idealized household poverty measure, but rather relative to this wealth index. Um, we're going to focus on uh, the poorest 20% and 40%. We're going to um, 
I'll also try to, this is a, there's a third paper in this series where we're trying to go more deeply into this, try to understand these conditional probabilities better, why it is that we're more effective in reaching poor households in some circumstances than others, poor individuals in some circumstances than others. So how important, for example, is intra-household inequality to these results. These are the wealth effects for just um, selected countries. I, I just did the first few by alphabetic order just to show you what they look like. These are, uh, so again, wealth percentiles, 0 to 100. This is the undernutrition rate. This is for, for women. This is the one for stunting. Um, you know, what we expect, uh, quite getting sometimes quite flat for, the, for, for kids. So, um, you know, there's a wealth effect everywhere. In fact, the parameter value is hugely significant. There's no question there's a wealth effect. But that, again, is not the relevant parameter. The relevant policy parameter here is going to be that conditional probability that I talked about, or the joint probability, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, and here, here they are. Proportion of undernourished individuals in the poorest 20% and 40% of households. The paper gives results for the national poverty rates. So here I've just shown you, so for example, in, in Gabon here, this number, that's saying 25% of undernourished women, that's BMI, body mass index under 80.5, um, 25% of undernourished women are in the poorest 20% of households. If you focus on the poorest 20% of households, you're going to miss 75% of the undernourished women. You go to, go to stunting, it, starts, it looks like it's better. All, all the time, stunting, which is a much more indicator of long-term nutritional status, and is, is stronger, tends to have... Um, uh, stronger correlations with things like uh, across countries with things like GDP or poverty rates. Uh, stunting, you're going to still miss over half of the stunted kids focusing on the poorest 20%. You go to 40%, we're, 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 things, we're, we're only missing 60% of the women uh, and, um, and so on. Wa wasting, wasting is, is much more a, a measure of short-term nutritional status. So if the kid is... Um, um, uh, if there's been a, a sudden crisis in the family, a, 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 a recent harvest failure or, or, or unemployment or something, it's going to be much more evident in wasting, but again, stunting is going to be long-term stuff. Here are the joint probabilities, so conditionals, you can back out the joints using the marginal. A um, little comment here, for example, Gabon, that's saying the joint probability of being an undernourished woman and living in the poorest 20% of households is 0.02. I was walking to work in Washington one day. <laughs> I met the guy who's the head of social protection in Africa. Five minutes, including questions. Okay. And I asked him, what does he think that joint probability is? And he said, oh, not that high, probably about 0.5. I don't know how he could get that. I mean, the marginals, I mean, it's a funny answer. But um, no. <laughs> I mean, you know, he, his job is to reach undernourished women. And of course, increasingly, the policy dialogue is about using anti-poverty policies and instrument for that purpose. And the point of this, all of this is to say, essentially, it's, it's not a good instrument. We're going to have to use other policies to reach deprived individuals, at least in terms of nutrition. Um, most of Africa's nutritionally vulnerable women and children are not found in poor households. I, I've said that already in, in the interest of time. Um, some work on, on trying to understand why these initial probabilities vary. And one obvious thing is whether how do they vary with the marginal. In other words, if we're in a place with more undernutrition, is it more spread or less spread? In fact, it's more spread through the distribution. The places where it's going to be more effective to use household data to reach undernourished women and children are places where there's less undernutrition. Alternatively, in poor places, in poor, the poorer countries, uh, amongst the 30 countries we're looking at here, the poorer countries, it's going to be much harder to use this type of policy. Your policy, is going to ha your policy dialogue is going to have to move towards much more universal policies in those settings if you want to have any reasonable hope of reaching undernourished women and children. Um, Conclusions then, uh, I've tried to essentially characterize this targeting trade-off between inclusion errors and exclusion errors. 
basic income uh, does exceptionally well, of course, on exclusionaries. Uh, we, we've seen new PMT methods that sort of switch the trade off a bit more in favor of reducing exclusion errors. Um, our findings on optimal on econometric targeting are pretty disappointing. As I said, we, we hope we come up with some great new solution for the policymakers, but it's looking pretty dismal. Um, household data are pretty weak in identifying poor individuals. I've summarized all that, and sorry, but time is a problem. Overall conclusion, eliminating poverty using transfers is much harder than the total poverty gap suggests. Vastly harder. Uh, I would actually say it's closer to the cost of a basic income scheme, which is about 40 or 50 times the poverty gap than it is uh, indicated by the poverty gap. So time to reconsider basic income. Last slide. Uh, this is something, if you follow my tweets and blogs and stuff, something I, I'm advocating a lot, that we need to put basic income on the menu for poor countries as well as rich countries. Thank you. Uh, what do you think is the potential for new kinds of data, like satellite photos, phone call records, um, that kind of thing? Well, any, any data will help. You, you know, more data, you'll get more impact. Um, I, I'm a bit skeptical on some of these sources. I mean, I've worked with satellite data doing that in India, and I'm pretty skeptical as a, as a poverty indicator. It doesn't buy me a lot of knowledge. Uh, but actually, I, 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 in one paper that's uh, coming out soon, we use satellite data to try to identify the, the differences between small towns and big towns, to try to identify the economic geography of poverty in India, and, and, and that's really insightful, right? I, I, that gives me a window on, uh, throws, light on, throws light on the economic geography of poverty. But as an indicator of poverty, uh, I don't find it very convincing, and for obvious reasons that getting electricity is sort of one thing, but there's a huge a lot of other things that, that matter. Yes. Oh, sorry. Other questions? So yeah. if, if you wanted to, to, to have the choice to double the information budget yeah. in some way. Well, we you want, saw... So we go from 50 yeah. times the poverty gap to three times the poverty gap, or we go from 50 to 43? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. That, that's exactly why we did these, these range of information sets. Paper gives more, the paper gives more detail, but, but the extended PMT is, is, is exactly address, trying to address that question. Right? No, right. But, the, but the, those right. data are based on surveys that were collected for whatever sets of purposes. Now, yeah. uh, you know, some billionaire foundation says to you, here is so many millions of dollars or billions of dollars and take a country and design the optimal yeah. Information collection, and I don't know whether it's satellite data or, you know, well, local it, community. If it doesn't already exist, I can't say much about it. But I, I, I can, at the margin, I can show you. At the margin, I can show you the gains from extra information, which I've tried to do. Um, that's all I can do. It would be speculation. I, uh, when the marginal gain from extra information is as small. <laughs> as what I'm showing, you're obviously inclined to think that there you are know, masses of information, but there could be some huge nonlinearity in the thing, whereby we do get some amazing explosion in our ability to reach poor people with some information set we've never had. But who knows? Other questions? Okay. So thank, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you.